If you would, please take your Bible and open up to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 as we continue our series through the book of Revelation. If you were in the book of Concordance, or maps, you have went too far. <laughs> if you were in the book of Genesis, you have not quite went far enough. So, um, but anyway, Revelation chapter 5, I'm going to, now that we've started this back, Revelation chapter 5. The fifth chapter of Revelation is really a continuance of chapter 4. We find that the one seated on the throne has sealed a book that no one is worthy. No one is worthy to open, not in heaven, not on earth, not anyone, or, or so it would seem. We find that John actually seems bitterly in grief, seems bitter and, and grieved over the fact that no one can open this book, this unique book, because... See, the scripture tells us it had writings on both sides. And, and during this time, it would, the scrolls at this time in the first century would be rolled out. And it would only be written on one side. It wouldn't be written on both sides. And this paper, this tells us in the book of Revelation that it was written on both sides. Not only was it unique in that fact, but it was unique in the fact that it had seven seals. And see, the seven seals were unique because normally there's only one seal on that letter. It was with wax, it was with a ring, and it could only be opened by the one that it was sent to, but this one has seven. It was customary during this time, especially with the Romans, and we'll get into this in a minute, that the only ones that had the seven seals on there were deeds and titles to land. And we find, though, at the height of John's anguish, that there was one that came on the scene, and only one that was worthy to open that scroll, to undo those seals, and that was the slain Lamb of God. And may we cry out this evening, worthy is the Lamb. Amen? Worthy is the Lamb. For he is, He's the one that gave Himself and sacrificed Himself for us. And so may we dive into chapter 5 with anticipation and excitement. For me, the chapter 5 of Revelation is really the one of the key passages of the totality of the book of Revelation. Uh, this is a chapter, it's a chapter of hope. It shows us that no matter what happens here on earth, there's one who owns the earth. There is one that is on his throne. No matter what, there is one that is still in charge, and that's God Almighty. He is still the one in charge. And this is still his world, and he still owns this world. And may we praise God for that. For if we continuously remind ourselves in this chapter, and while studying the rest of the wonderful book, we will be encouraged, strengthened, and broken all at once. And praise God for that. Revelation chapter 5 and verses 1 through 14. If you're there, say amen. It says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side <clears throat> sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you tonight, and Lord, we seek you as we have throughout, Lord. We seek your wisdom and your word and your truth. We ask, Father God, that you would be in control. We ask, Father God, that you speak and not I. That, Lord, we would find encouragement in this. Even though we'll find later as these seals are open, judgment comes. But, God, let us realize who's the one that's in control. Who sits on the throne, and that's you. It's not Putin. It's, it's not Trump. It's not any world leader that sits on the throne. It's you, God Almighty. It is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of your throne, praying in intercession for us as his children and as his bride. And so praise God for that. We thank you for that, Lord. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. We first find this five, this seven sealed book discovered, not a five sealed, but this seven sealed book discovered in verse one. It says, "And I saw on the right hand him that sat on the throne that was God, was was Christ, was a, a throne book." And it says on the throne a, a book written within and on the back side and sealed with seven seals. So what is this book that God holds in His hand? And these two theories have been given really uh, in, in what this is. The first one, it is theorized that this book is the deed to the world. Nobody knows that for sure, but we, the we can theorize by most theologians that this is a deed to the world. It also theorized by other theologians this book is a prophesied judgment of the world is I have prayed and studied through the years as I've looked through the book of Revelation and throughout the, the, the rest of the Scripture. I, I believe it's not either or or, but both. I believe it's both. I, I believe that we can, through the customs of the first century and through the Scriptures that we find, support of both. One, the, the theory that it is the deed to the world. As I said earlier, it was the custom of the Roman Empire in the first century to seal titles and deeds and land with seven seals. No one could remove those seals except for the owner. Uh, this book is seven sealed book in which none of creation could open. There was not a man found on the earth that could open this book. No animal could open this book. There was only one that could open this book and it happens to be the creator and the, and the judge and the jury and the executioner of the world and that was Jesus Christ Himself. It's His land. It's His property. None of them were worthy but Jesus alone. And there's one that's worthy, the creator of heaven and earth, God Himself come in the flesh. We need to understand, many have said, well, this world is Satan's. No. It's still the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan may be the prince of this world, but remember one day he will be judged and cast out himself. John 12 and 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John 16 11 says of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan may be the prince of the power of the air, and he may be di dictating his satanic ploy to try to deceive those from accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and to be able to be reprobate and fall in the things of this world rather than the things of God. But my, may I declare to you tonight that there's still one that owns this world, and that is God Almighty. It is still His. It is still His. He still owns it. There is but one owner and creator, and that is God Almighty. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The author of Hebrews in 1 and verse 10 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. In Hebrews 10, 2 and 10 it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Things. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 15 through 17, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created there in heaven and there on earth, visible, invisible. Whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. And we need to understand something. When Colossians, when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, and he wrote that Jesus Christ, speaking of Jesus, said, who is the image of the invisible God, he was saying that God took a metal plate, an imprinting plate of himself and snapped it down and Jesus Christ was there. That when you see Jesus Christ, you see God. Jesus was not created. He has been there from the beginning. And then when we see Jesus, we hear of Jesus, we're seeing and hearing God. And he is the owner of this world. So we can see the theory that it's Jesus and it's the deed to the world. But we also can have the theory that this seven sealed book is a book of prophesied judgment. It is declared in the Old Testament as a book of limitations by the prophet Ezekiel. It is declared in the Old Testament as a book that is to be sealed and that will last for many days and for the last days as spoken of in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 8 and 26 it says, And the visions of the evening and morning which was told in truth were shut up thou the vision for it shall be for many days. It's declared in the Old Testament as a book that delivers a curse upon the whole earth. By, by, in the prophet, the prophet Daniel it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even in the time of the end. Get this, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. We... 
We live in a time where knowledge is increasing over and over, and yet the time is coming to a close. And it's declared as a book of doom by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 5 and verses 1 through 3. See, as we look at this book, we need to understand something about Jesus. He not only is the creator and the owner of this world, he is also the judge of this world. See, one day each and every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Doesn't matter whether you're a child of God or you're lost. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged. Now, there's two judgments that take place. There's the Bema seat, the judgment seat. For those of the Christians, our salvation is not at stake, but our rewards are at stake. But then there's also the great white throne judgment. And that's the judgment of the laws. And we can't escape that. Nobody can escape the judgment of God. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But which state, where will you stand at the judgment? And in which judgment will you stand? Because you are not your own and you are bought with a price. And you will either stand at the great white throne judgment or just the judgment seat to be. But one or the other, you will be judged. And we have this idea as Christians today that we can go and live like we want to and however we want to. And if we don't believe what the Word of God says and thus saith the Lord, we keep doing what we want to do. How many Christians today, good, good, supposed to be good, meaning, well-meaning Christians, they say homosexuality is okay even though the Bible says it's not. They say abortion is okay even though, they say the, even though the Bible says it is not. They say this is right, but the Bible says it's not. They say this is right, but the Bible's not. One day, those same Christians are going to have to stand before God and give an account why they argued with His Word. See, we need to understand that. My daughter's one day... Won't come to dad when something's been wrong. They won't come to mama. They won't be able to flutter tears and flutter their eyes and do their little smiles and try to get out of it. See, we try to do that as kids. We try to excuse our way out of things. We try to find ways to this and ways to that. But when we stand before God and judgment is coming and he is the judge. What excuse are we going to give? For none were worthy to open the deed except for the Lamb. He's our creator, our owner. None of creation is worthy to open it. In verses 2 through 4 it says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. None of creation has a right to say this world is his or hers. None of creation. None of it is. None of what we have is ours. We could say our money, our homes, vehicles, electronic devices. Truly, it's not yours. It's God's. The money you have in your checking account, God gave that to you. Your homes, God gave that to you. Your vehicles, God gave that to you. We have this idea that, well, we, we made ourselves. None of us made ourselves. It was God that's given it to us. And he's, he's given more to others because they can handle more, maybe. We have this idea in our head, well, I'm a self-made. You're not anything without Jesus Christ. Will we not understand that? We're, we are not anything without the Lord God. Our very being is not ourself, but it's God's. That's the reason the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Rome, he says, be living sacrifices for God. Knowing that every decision we make, if you claim to be a child of God, what you watch on TV, what you listen on the radio, what you talk about, what you discuss, how you talk, how you act, all that 
Get this, the Holy Spirit is right there with you and you're making the Holy Spirit enjoy that conversation with you. And when we start realizing that we're not ourselves, that we were bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ, it starts opening our eyes up to realize, "Uh, the Lord was right there with me when I said that. The Lord was right there with me when I did that. When I seen that, when I listened to that, when I acted like that, when I was back there acting a fool, the Lord was right there with me and the Spirit was right. Yes. Because we're not our own. None of creation has the right to say they own it. The scripture lets us know that this broke John. The fact that nobody could open this book to realize that no one was able to the book caused him great grief. Because he wanted to know this. It was in heaven. He wanted to know what it was. May I declare to you, we, we shouldn't grieve, but rather celebrate that none of creation could open that book other than Jesus Christ. Amen? That shouldn't be a time of grief, but a time of celebration, knowing there was only one that could do it, and that was Jesus. Because God made the world and gave it to us to keep and look over and see what we've done. We've built death rays, atom bombs, killed and destroyed continuously. There's no limit to the excitement over the fact that we're not in control. My goodness. Man gets involved and it messes everything up. You want to mess up a church? Let man start taking the head of the head of the helm on a church. You let spirit guide, you let God lead, you let the spirit lead, that church will be on fire and it can keep moving and blowing. You let a man step up and start trying to lead, not the spirit of God lead, you're going to find a church implode on itself. Amen? Because it's not about us. It's about him. It's allowing the spirit of God to guide, lead, and direct. May God use men to do that? Yes. But he's still the leader and should be at the helm. Man has and always will mess things up and bring everything to utter destruction if it were not for the invention or the intervention of God. And in verses 5 through 7, we find Christ alone is worthy to open it. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood as a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth in the, all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, saying with a loud voice in verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We're not to weep over the fact that there was only one that could open that book. That angel tells Don, weep not. Weep not. We have no reason to weep. We know who is on the throne. We know who is worthy, who is in control, and that is Jesus Christ. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Is this situation right now with North Korea and things going on in the Middle East and all that, can it get you a little antsy? Yeah. But if God's for you, who can be against you? Who's in control ultimately of that situation? And you can say, well, you got a loud mouth preacher and you got a crazy dictator over here, or a loud mouth president, and you got a crazy dictator over here, and that's crazy. And that's scary. And you don't know which one, and you don't know either one of them whether they're crazy enough to actually do it or not. And that's true. But who's the one that raises up kings and puts kings down? That's God Almighty. And there's nothing that takes place without God's hand. He controls it all, says yes or no. And when God is on the throne, we have nothing to worry about. We've got to trust Him. Trust him. It says, weep not. There's two messianic prophecies mentioned in our text that remind us who Jesus is. One, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the lion, the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. He is in control. He is king. He is from the lineage of David. He is that root of David in reference to 2 Samuel and Isaiah chapter 11. He, he, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of the world. In Isaiah 53 and 7 it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb unto the slaughter, as a sheep before a sheriff is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. See, Jesus may have came as the lamb at first. 
He came as a root of David, as in the flesh. But when he comes back, oh, he's the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. See, he may came first as that sacrificial lamb in meekness, but one day he'll come back as king. Bruce M. Metzger states in the book Breaking the Code that he, John, looked to, see the, looked to see the power and force by which the enemies of his faith would be destroyed. And he sees sacrificial love and gentleness as the way to win the victory. See, the might of Christ is the power of love. Most Jews had been expecting a Messiah who would break the yoke of the Roman imperial power and and liberate his people. The fundamental transformation of the the messianic expectation becomes obvious on that first Palm Sunday when Jesus presented himself as God's Messiah and he rode into Jerusalem, but he doesn't come on on the back end of a white horse. What does he come? He comes on the back end of the foal of a donkey because he came in peace. J.V. McGee states, the Lord Jesus is a lion and a lamb. The lion character refers to his second coming. The lamb character refers to his first coming. The lion is symbolic of his majesty. The lamb symbolic of his meekness. As a lion, he is sovereign. As a lamb, he is savior. As a lion, he is judge. As a lamb, he is judge. The lion represents the government of God and the lamb represents the grace of God. Just think of who Jesus is. He came with meekness at first, but he will come back to judge. Judge. We must remember who Jesus is. Christ is the omnipotent one symbolized by the seven horns. Christ is the omniscient one symbolized by the horn, the eyes, and the addition of the seven spirits of God, which address all of one's being. Christ is the creator, owner, and judge of this world. Nobody does anything without God first letting it be known. Let's continue in our text. It says, And the four beasts, each on the, them six wings, and about him were full of eyes within and out. In verses 8 through 10, we find the, the redeemed of God singing and leading. It says, And the four beasts, each had, the, seven, had, the, had the, the, the six wings and about him, and they were full of eyes within, and the rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. And, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, and he goes on, and four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crones before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they were created. Find that first beast was like a lion. I'm, I, you know what? I didn't completely went up in the wrong chapter. I am so sorry. That's why y'all looking at me like, what in the world is he saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll, back, we'll backtrack on that. Ray, just, just work with me. It says in verse 7, we find that Jesus, remember who Jesus is, Christ is the omnipotent one. He's symbolized by those seven horns. Christ is the omniscient one, symbolized by the horn, the eyes, and those seven spirits of God which address all of one's being. And Christ is our creator, owner, and judge. And in verses 8 through 10, we see the redeemed of the Lord singing. When he had taken the book of the four beasts and the four and twenty elders, fell down before the Lamb, having one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. We find the church represented and singing a song before the Lord. It goes on and it says that they had these vials that were before him. <coughs> These prayers of the saints, they took the prayers of the saints and gave it as a sacrifice to God. And he goes on and it says, Having one of the hearts and golden balls of favor, which are the prayers of the saints, and we find this in a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. May we understand how great the Lord Jesus Christ is. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And let them sing a new song and praise God. So often in our life we sit back and we get worried and we we, we deal with uncertainties. But may we understand who is on his throne. The 
seven seals and was slain and redeemed and has redeemed us to God by the blood of by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on earth join heirs with the Lord. And he says, I heard and beheld the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beast and the elders, and the number of them that set ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands upon thousands. The redeemed church. Praise the Lord. The redeemed church. You know, I got a wife that can sing. I got two daughters that sing beautifully. And their dad can't carry it. I cannot say. Y'all need to stop. I can't. But one day, this will be one day, I'm going to be up there with the 10,000 times 10,000. And I'm going to be able to praise God just like this. And I'm going to be able to say, I'm going to be just as good as my babies, just as good as my wife. To the redeemed church, worships the Leads in worship of God. I, I get jealous sometimes of Ray, Kellyanne, and Wendy, and Mary, and the girl, and everybody else who sings, they get up and they can lead music. And I can't. But one day the Bible says that the redeemed of the Lord will lead worship in heaven. Now I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, beasts and elders, and the number of them was 10,000. Times ten thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was, was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. We're not worthy, but He is. He's worthy of the, to receive the power, the riches, the wisdom, and the strength and honor and glory and blessings. Worthy is the Lamb to be praised. If we're going to praise somebody, let's not praise the pastor, let's praise the Lord. Amen? Let's not praise the music, let's praise the Lord. It's not about the musicians, it's not about the pastor, it's not about something. It's about God Almighty. None of us are here to entertain, we're here to lead and worship and praise. It says, every creature which is in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, such as in the sea, and all that are in the earth, I say, blessing and honor and glory and power to be him to sit on the throne and on the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. May we understand when we sing our hymns, you need to get used to it. This right here is rehearsal time, brothers and sisters. We have rehearsal time. We had this idea, well, I, I don't want to sing that person's time and they may hear me. Really? Are you singing for them? We, we act like we're going in the band and we're going in the choir and we're trying to fight for seat one, two, three, and four. I'm not in a seat for nobody. I'm here just to praise God. This is practice time. This is rehearsal. Because when we get to heaven, we're all going to be busting out a tune for the Lord. So why don't we start here and now? You can sing your favorite rock star songs. You can sing your favorite pop star song. You can sing your favorite country song singer. But you can't come to church and go down the floor. Why not? Is that not hypocrisy? Because we can sing the world's tunes, but we can't sing God's tunes. And it doesn't matter whether it comes out with heavenly highways or the Baptist hymn. That country singer, he's not worthy. That pop star, he's not worthy. That rock star, he's not worthy. But there is one who is worthy. And that is the Lamb. And that is the Lamb. He's the one that sacrificed himself for you. He's the one that gave his life for you. Do you know him tonight? And you surrender to his Lordship. And you fell to your knees and said, I need Jesus. Because nobody else in this room is giving their life for you. Nobody else inside here is giving their life for you. Jesus Christ has. Do you know what's not? Everybody stand, please, every day, every eye closed. Where are you at tonight? Where are you at tonight? Father God, we come before you. Lord, we seek you tonight. We seek your will, your word, your truth. Father God, touch you. Touch your mind, touch your heart. Speak to us. 
should be honored during this time of invitation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You come. You come. Page 
Yeah, you couldn't mean, see him. You couldn't know, see me. <laughs> Boy, you are right. Yes, sir. Did you win? 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 Did you